Well, hello everybody. Another great day. The sun is shining here where I'm at. A sweet, sweet day for the end of April. Now, we have concluded some of the preparatory items that will help us continue through our faith. So, now we've reached man's response to God. Now, without us responding, all of God's revelations to us would be just lost in the wind. Man is given the desire and the ability to be with and act in relationship with God. So, while our response will be pitiful and small in comparison to how much God gave to each of us, God hears us and loves every moment. We can almost think of our response as a little picture on God's refrigerator. I bet he has the coolest refrigerator, I'm telling you. So, there are two parts to this. There is, by God's revelation, the fullness of his love addressing us as friends. And he even moves among us to pass along his company to us. Now, we see this probably most clearly in the book of Genesis, but this happens all the time to us if we're paying close attention. Second, there is our faith. In this faith, we completely submit our intellect and our will to God. We say yes to God. Now, at the end of Paul's letter to the Romans, he calls this the obedience of faith. So, we can use obedience of faith to describe man's response to God. Obey means to hear or listen to. So, to obey in faith is to submit freely to the word which has been heard. It certainly would be nice if we had a model or two to see how this obedience works. Thankfully, the Catechism uses two models for showing us this obedience or this listening to. The first is Abraham. He is our first model of faith which we encounter. Look at the things that we were done by him with God's help. First he went with his own land, Ur, and he listened to God stay, staying in a strange land. He had no idea where to go. He knew God would lead him. Then, when he stayed in the strange land, Abraham waited as Sarah was given to conceive the son which Abraham was promised. Finally, Abraham trusted God so much that he actually went to offer his only son, knowing that God promised him a great nation by his descendants. And he brought his son up so well in faithfulness to God that Isaac went along to place the place of sacrifice. Help, actually helping Abram with the deed to be done. Now, if we look through the letter to Hebrews and head to chapter 11, we can read about this author's idea of how faithful and righteous Abraham was. The other model which we can use for faithfulness is the Virgin Mary. She listened to God. She said yes to God's plan. She followed through on God's plan no matter how much it hurt her or her son. We do have to remember that it's true, God did, did give his only son, Jesus. Well, we certainly cannot forget, Mary gave him up also. So, how many of us can actually say that everything we have done has been listening to God's word and only doing that? Not going on in our own way and thinking we have a better plan. I certainly can't say that. I started off the day grumbling at the sunlight blinding me, so right off the bat, I'm offending God, and this is before I even get out of bed. So, but Mary, she stood stout-hearted and stayed true to God's word, always. We talk about Mary, and we talk about her a lot, and everyone should. She is the greatest example we can see of human beings working with God's plan and never breaking with it. Her faith in God never wavered and never ceased believing. This is why we venerate her so. Venerate just means to honor. And that's what the saints do. Well, they give us examples they, that hopefully bring our faith life alive and try to function with that much faith. So never forget, though, that the saint just means in heaven. But that is the goal which we all should be attempting, right? Now, that being said, we have to move into the areas in which we believe. Now, no one should believe that Abraham or Mary is God. No creature can have that faith put upon it. 
We are to believe in God, though, no question. So what is it about God? We believe in him as our creator. It's interesting that if we look at the definition gave, given for faith, it is first, a personal adherence of man to God, and faith is a free assent to the whole truth that God has revealed. Faith in God differs from faith in another human being. Using the words of mass, we can say that it's right and just that we would give that trust to oneself wholly to God and to believe absolutely in what God says. I do not have faith in another creature, whether it's another human, an animal, or even a plant. Paul's second letter to Timothy says the following, On this account I am suffering these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know him in whom I have believed, and I am confident that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Such a beautiful sentiment of faith. It's professed for God in that statement. So, is there other things that we should have faith in? Of course, we believe in the triune God. And it means three persons in one God. So just as we spoke of the first person of the Trinity, but we cannot speak about God and separate him from himself. We must also have faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus was the Word made flesh and proved his divinity through the Gospels. Now from John 14, we read, Believe in God, believes also in me. Jesus said that as there are, he wanted to point to his being God. There are two of the three persons then of God. We have to have faith in, all, in the Holy Spirit as well. Christ shares his spirit uh, Paul, in the first uh, Corinthians, says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, only God knows himself completely, and therefore we believe in the Holy Spirit because he is God. If we jump back a little closer to the beginning of First Corinthians, it says, This God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit scrutinizes everything, even the depths of God. Now, we've already gone through the process of determining the scriptures is God's word and that all that he says through the scripture is true. We've learned to interpret and use our senses to determine this. We did much of this using de verbum, but notice here when we're talking about God and the Trinity, we're looking throughout the Bible. Remember, it's the word of God, so he reveals himself in what he says. In this way, the church never ceases to profess her faith in the one, only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we as human beings use both our intellect and our wills to have faith. We have examples to use that, intellect, uh, that our intellect and will will form our own faith. It's incredibly important because we need to have proper formation. This is the help which we spoke about in our introductory vi videos. We've been talking about faith and whom we have faith in, which obviously is God. But we must grab a hold of the characteristics of faith as well. So what are these characteristics? Well, first off, faith is a grace. It's a gift from God. There are some you might hear say they have no faith in God. And that is possible. You see, we all have this virtual built, virtue built into us. However, the virtue of faith does need God's help. The Holy Spirit moves us to, moves us to move our hearts and minds. We can see this somewhat clearly in the more, more recent polls about prayer. Uh, now, Pew Research poll showed that 15% of people who have seldom or never prayed, are currently praying. That's an amazing number. The stirring of God is still active, even we, we ourselves allow for the faith life to become dormant. There are a number of characteristics. Now, faith is a human act. While believing is only possible by grace, an interior change by the Holy Spirit is also a human act. There is nothing inherent in trusting God 
or the truths he reveals that infringes upon our freedom of will or our reason. So, knowing that, even between humans, we can have faith in what a person says about himself and their intentions. I know a bit ago I said you could not have faith in another human being, but I was comparing that faith in God against against the man, and the two are not comparable. But here we're talking about showing and preserving the dignity of man, that we can trust him in certain matters. We can trust the promises, for example, when a man and a woman are getting married and they're making vows to each other. So, two also, uh, faith in is understanding. An interesting aspect of faith is that it almost moves us to believe in it. Due to they appear to be true and intelligible in the light of our natural reason. So all three of those pull, pull us right on in. Now there's some absolutely beautiful quotes that come from the First Vatican Council in 1870. It's called De Filius, or the Son of God. Um, we believe because of the authority of God himself who reveals them, who can neither deceive or be deceived, so that the submission of our faith might nonetheless be accordance with reason, God will that external, external proofs of this revelation should be joined to the internal helps of the Holy Spirits. Now, in other words, all of those miracles we hear about by Christ and by the saints, the prophecies, the church's growth, its holiness, along with her fullness and stability, are really the most beautiful signs given to prove our faith. So, one point of clarification, though. We will see this numerous times. We must differentiate between the church and the humans in the church. The church itself is holy as it comes from God. The men and women within the church are hopefully still working upon becoming holy. But we do have to make that differentiation there between the church, the bride of Christ, and the men and women running the institution here on earth. But more about that later on. Freedom of faith. Um, one of the things that you generally not thought about too much with faith is freedom. As Christians, we're always proposing a solution, ethic, etc. But we're not to be forcing people. Nothing can truly be believed by forcing our will upon another. That takes away from another person's dignity. We have all seen someone when they've been trying to force some other person to believe in this or that. But the most that we'll get is perhaps a polite, uh-huh. But it's not going to lead to faith. And we have to be careful with this. We have seen news stories of forced conversions. And it's not free. It's always through coercion. That's not freedom of faith. One may be able to force someone to do an act, but faith is a matter of the will and the intellect. We should always propose and offer faith in Christ as the best solution to everyone. Answer questions as best as possible, and then if not sure, work hard, try and find the correct answer. Necessity of faith. I think this one should be just read as it is written from paragraph 161. Believing in Jesus Christ and in the one who sent him, for our salvation is necessary for obtaining that salvation. Since without faith it is impossible to please God and to attain the fellowship of his sons, therefore without faith no one has ever attained justification, nor will anyone obtain eternal life, but he who endures to the end. Now from Hebrews 11.6, says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For anyone who approaches God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This list goes on and on through scriptural reference, papal letters, court, uh, uh, church documents, going all the way back to the beginning of the church itself. And this is one of the basic tenets of our faith. The belief will bring salvation. It's necessary for men. Mankind is bound to this teaching. This is why it's so important to evangelize when we come upon a 
upon areas of incorrect faith, distorted faith, or even no faith. Perseverance of faith. Notice that at the end of the paragraph, it mentions he who endures to the end. You can hear this in Matthew 10, 22. You will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. But the one, and then from 10, 13, it says, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. It though is imperative that we remember that faith is still a free gift. We can lose this gift almost due to misuse or negligence. St. Paul warns Timothy to hold on to the faith and a good conscience. Conscience can be stained and tarnished, warped and ignored. In order to stick with this faith until the end, it's necessary that we continue to seek and increase it and nourish it. We can do this through reading the scriptures. We can beg God to increase our faith through prayer, work through charity, faith, hope. And of course, the Mass is there as well. So we're really looking at those cardinal virtues, which we constantly work to maintain. So faith is really the beginning of eternal life. If we put all of this together, it's really a foretaste of the vision of God. Now, this vision of God we will call the beatific vision. And the vision we can get, we'll take, take the word be, uh, beatific, though. It sort of brings our mind to the Beatitudes, which you, uh, we know from Sermons on the Mount and Sermons on the Plain. The Beatitudes in chapter 5 of Matthew and chapter 7 of Luke give us those characteristics of God. All those blesseds are, they mean joyous, happy, holy. And that brings us straight to God because he is all of those things. It is all wrapped up in his love. When we speak of the beatific vision, we are speaking of the direct vision of God as he really is. But on here on earth, we get a dim reflection. That's why we hear from 2 Corinthians, we walk by faith and not by sight. The world we live in certainly seems a far cry from which we're promised by our faith. This is why we took those, those models that we talked about a little while ago. They give us examples of how to run the race that Paul talks about and the instructions which we get from God himself through Christ. We have a road set before us, and we can continue through that road, just as Abraham did, in hope he believed where he looked about there was nothing to hope for. But his faith brought him through. And the Virgin Mary lost all in sharing the loss of her son, suffering and death. We looked at these models and all the other models brought to us for the world, allowing us to continue the race, looking toward Jesus as the perfecter of our faith. So next time, we're going to take a look at our creeds, the Apostles' Creed as well as the Nicene Creed. Take a look at that. Move on that, probably take another week to put that together. So we'll take care of yourself. I ask for your prayers. I'll be praying for you guys. Be good. Play nice. Thank God. Mm -hmm.